Hello, it's April 8th, 2015. We're going into Chapter 7 in Unit 7. Uh, this chapter focuses around the topics you see right here. Uh, characters, strings, and the string builder. Um, working with strings is kind of an interesting thing in this language because it, it is not a native data type. So in other words, when you work with other languages, you can, you'll just say, it's a string, and you just type out some text, and you, and you have a string, right? Java does not work that way. In Java, you can have a character, and that's why they list characters here. So a character is a single character. A string is a collection of characters, and that's not a data type. However, we do create strings, and we use it kind of like a data type in the same way that we would create a class definition and kind of use that as a data type. And I'm hoping that you'll you'll see the the difference here as we're we're doing it. So that's kind of just a very brief uh, synopsis. All right. So one thing that um, they try to point out here, and this is not an uncommon programming issue if you think about it. Uh, let's say you go to a website and you try to log in, and you type in your password, right? Your username and then your password. And then they run some sort of a script that says, is what they typed equal to the password that we have in our database? Mm -hmm. Right? And you do that through a comparison. So how do you know it's the same? Well, OK, well, that letter's the same. This letter's the same. And you just look to see. Now, that sounds like it's easy, but not, a, not really. You know, there's some challenges to it. If it's a number, a number's worth a certain amount. And so a number's a number. But a string, you can have uppercase, you can have lowercase. What if there's a space in it? What if there's a special character? Uh, you know, what if it's really close but not quite? You know, so you got all, all these different little issues here. Um, but they're, they're talking here uh, about this little operator. All right. And, it, and notice how it says don't do it. It says, do not use equal equal to compare string contents. Now, the question is, why? And the answer is, the thing I have highlighted here at the very bottom, it says, when you compare two string objects, notice the word objects here, the equal equal, or the equivalency, equivalency operator, uh, you're comparing. You're, you are not comparing their values, but their computer memory locations. Now that's a little bit odd. Now the reason that's the case is because strings are not a data, data type. They are an array of characters. So when you do, go to do the comparison, it doesn't know what to do. That's, that's kind of the, uh, the point. All right, so, and I'm going to go back to that word here, uh, object, right? When you create a class file, if you can think back to some of the exercises that we did, like the one where uh, we were creating a character, right? We, the number of lives, the number of eyes, remember that? All right, so you create a class file that, for the character, and then you create an instance of that class, so you create a character based upon it, and that becomes an object. That thing that we created from it is an object. And so when they say here, when you compare two string objects, it's telling you that string is really a class in the same way. And then we make a, a, a version of it, and that becomes an object. So every time you have a string, it's actually an object. So it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting concept in itself. So there, from there we go and look at these different uh, definitions, and I think I covered some of this already. And uh, here it says character, a class, notice the word class, whose instances can hold a single character value and whose methods manipulate and inspect the single character data. So they're also telling us that a character is a class. And notice 
that it's the whole word and not C-H-A-R. Okay, it's a little bit different. Okay, then for string it says a class for working with fixed string data. That is unchanging data composed of multiple characters. So if I create a string and I put in there, let's say my full name, and that's not going to change because that's my full name, that is an example of, of that. Okay. So in other words, we're putting together a string of characters and those will stay the way they are. All right. So that that's what the unchanging part is about. Then we have these two, two things, the string builder and the string buffer. Both of those are very important. It says classes for storing and manipulating changeable data composed of multiple characters. All right. So you see the difference here? So when you have um, multiple characters strung together, really you have a string. But these two functions look at it in a little bit different way. They look at that string as separate little components stuck together and then have the ability to go in and manipulate those little pieces separately. So I'm trying to think of an example here, but if I gave you like a list of letters as a string and I said alphabetize these, what procedure do you go through in your head? How, how do you do that? Do you ever think about it? Right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a weird thing, but I mean, you just kind of intuitively know how to do it. But at some point, somebody said, okay, um, well, A goes first. So you see any letters that start with A? Of course, here's an A, and then you put that in the first position. But if you already have your array built, uh, and you know, probably a good example would be something like, uh, using Excel here. So let me see if I can just pull this up on screen quick. So you got all these different uh, positions here in the in the table. And let's just say I type in a random series of characters. Right? And really it would probably be better if I did it this way. Alright, so if you can just imagine that's a random string of characters put into an array and really if I want to kind of simulate it being a string I can make it a little bit smaller maybe that was too small so you can kind of see it as being a string okay that's kind of what a, what a string is it's really characters all strung together but if I wanted to let's say manipulate these letters to put the D in the first position, how do I actually do that? If I pick up the D and move it here, it's going to overwrite the X. So we don't want to do that. So I would actually have to take the X, move it, take the D, put it here, take the X, put it there. You see the procedure? And that's how computer memory works. Because if I move something directly, what was there is then gone. And now, you guys can tell me what letter comes next, right? Well, G would come next. But here's the thing. Like, if, if we were to sort it, I already know X is going to be the last letter. I would just take it and put it at the end. But that's, once again, not how the computer works. It's not how it alphabetizes and sorts, at least not under most normal scenarios. It depends on the scenario you create. But it'll probably do something like this, right? And then you just keep going until it's all alphabetical. So that's kind of a little bit of a very crude preview of some of the stuff that working with strings can do. How do you how do you alphabetize things? How do you order things? How do you make sure that this one's the same as that one? Right? If I took all of these letters here, pasted them in and then took a couple of them and and moved them, are these the same? They have all the same letters, why aren't they the same? Well, it depends on if we're checking order or not, right? All right, so you see, you know, see the difference? And if these are all capitals, would that matter? Well, it depends. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. 
Can you think of any scenarios where you're interacting with a computer and you type in all caps and it doesn't matter if it's all caps or lowercase? Does it? Really? Okay. Well, that's an example of it where it does matter. But like one place where it doesn't matter is like email addresses. You know, you can use all caps or all lowercase. It doesn't matter. Because lo lowercase is all that really counts uh, when you do an email address. Same is true when you do a, a website address. You can type coca-cola.com all caps. It's the same as typing coca-cola.com all lowercase. All right, so sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, let's get back to uh, our, our talk here. Now, built into Java, as with other languages, you're going to find that they have a bunch of different uh, methods, and you know, think of them as tools for doing certain things with characters uh, and, and strings. So notice what this does. I think they're pretty, you know, evident as to what they do just from their name. So this method is called is uppercase. And what does it do? It checks to see if a character is uppercase. And notice it says a character, not a string. Yep. Isn't that fun? And this is why you learn loops before you learn strings in Java. Because I'm going to check each character in a string. You got to loop through. So, all right. And then they, you can check is uppercase, checks to see if it is. To uppercase, and you may have done this in Visual Basic, perhaps. It takes whatever letter is there and makes it uppercase. So is it, is, checks it, to, changes it. So I can check to see if it's lowercase, or I can change it to lowercase. That, that's what that means. And the same with these, and these are pretty obvious. Is it a digit? Is it a letter? Is it a letter or digit? I really don't care as long as it's something. <laughs> is it white space? So you can actually check to see if it's if it's blank. All right. All right. So they go through an exercise here to show you what those do. I'm not so concerned with that. So you can see how rapidly I'm going through the chapter. Uh, I'm not going to do the you do it's here because we're going to go directly to the exercises when I finish up with this lecture. So if you want to step through and do all the you do it's, uh, there's a lot of valuable little techniques that you can learn in there. Uh, but given the fact that we're pushing towards the end of the semester, uh, I want to talk about strings. I want to talk about arrays. And then we need to get into inheritance uh, and polymorphism before we wind up. If we're lucky, maybe we can get even a little farther. It just kind of depends. But what this is showing you is that these chapters might not be quite as in-depth as some of the previous ones. And I'm going to focus on what I, I consider to be the important topics here. All right. So let's take a look at some of the syntax they talk about. Um, notice here that they have a little thing, and you may have heard this little terminology, and I'll throw in my highlight. It says, you learned in Chapter 1 that a sequence of characters enclosed within double quotation marks is a literal string. Some programmers also call it a string literal. That sounds like a good exam question. I'm not sure what, how I would write that, but... <laughs> it depends. All right. All right, so here... Um, now, an example of, of something like that is when you... Uh, do, for example, a system out print line, right? And then you put in your double quotes and you have something that comes up on the screen and you close your double quotes. That's a string literal. So it's not something that's assigned to a variable. We don't give it a data type. 
we just do it, right? Because we just want to quickly get it on the screen. So that, that's what they call the string literal. Now, whenever we use a string, it's actually part of a library, and this is the name of the library right here, that's automatically built into the language. So somewhere there is a separate class file that indicates what, uh, what a string is. You know, it has a definition for it. And because it has a class definition, we can create string objects. All right. So they go through and they, they show us some of the stuff that we already know. And that is how to assign a value to a string. Now notice that this approach here is one that you would probably think of, right? So if you look at this version compared to this one, and notice that if we've used strings at all in any of our programs so far, we probably have just done this. And if you use any other language, this is the approach that you use typically. So what that's showing you is this is a, actually a shortcut method because this is the real technical way to do it. Because string is a class, we give it a name, and then we say new string, which calls upon the class file. We throw in the text hello, and it puts hello into this name. So this is equivalent to that. This is a shorthand method of doing this. This should look familiar when you're doing a constructor when you're working with any class file. I'll tell you that most people don't spell it out that way, but I want you to be aware of the two variances and not be afraid to use one or the other. So if you see this, it is the same as this and vice versa in your code. All right. The next thing they, they walk into is doing a little bit of a comparison as to how strings get compared. So Okay, they go through a little bit of an example um, on how you declare a string, give it a value, and then can actually change its value and what that does to the location in memory for that particular item. So they make a little point here, um, and I feel like I re I'm repeating myself, but it says, String is a class, and each string created is an object. That's a good one, too. All right. But here's the, the important part. It says a string variable name is a reference. So when I name my string, all it really does is it tells me a location in memory where the string is located. So, for example, think of the way a card catalog works at the library. All right. I go to the card catalog. I find what I want. Right. We have a little card. It says, okay, this is the title of the book. This is the author. This is whatever. But ultimately, that card does not really contain the information. It's got all the definitions there, but you have to actually go to the location to pull the data back. And that's really what, what string uh, variables do. They set up a pointer to the memory location. And this is a little bit hard to grasp initially. Um, and, and really, for the most part, you can kind of ignore it in terms of functionality. but if you run into some errors, that's where you know you start to kind of unravel this and try to figure out what's going wrong. It says the distinction is subtle, but when you declare a variable of a basic primitive type, such as an integer, 
the memory address where x is located holds the value 10. So x has a location in memory. That location in memory holds the number 10 because that location can hold the number 10. All right. That's not necessarily the case with the string because the string can get really complex and the data that it would take to put a string together is different than the data it takes to declare a number. And because it's more complex, all we can do is point to the spot where it is and then read in the characters. All right. It says, in contrast, when you declare a string, the variable does not hold the characters. Instead, it holds a memory address where the characters are stored. So here's where the problem comes in. If I go to, to compare one string and the other string, it's going to say, well, this one's in memory location 10, this one's in memory location 20. They don't match, even if the strings are identical. Because the variable does not hold the value, it holds the location of the string. See the difference? Kind of my, my primitive card catalog uh, example. All right, so if you look at the diagram here, then this starts to make a little more sense with that in mind. Where I set up a variable, the computer puts it in this location. Notice that the variable gets reassigned. Notice that the um, the memory locations change if you start moving stuff around. And it, it just works in a little bit strange fashion than what you're used to in terms of variables. So because that's the case, we have to deal with string comparisons in a little bit different way. And that's, um, you know, the, the point of all this. So they actually have a a thing that we can use and um, we have this one for example which does exactly what we hope just the equal equal would do and it says it's got this method called equals and that one does check to see if that string is the same as a different string so you can see down in the example here below how they're utilizing that. So you have one string here called a name. Then you have another string called another name. You're asked to enter your name. And then at one point they take a name dot equals. Now keeping in mind that string is a class and classes have methods, so the string class has a method called equals, whose job it is to check to see if one string is the same as the other. So if I want to check, uh, you know, whether something is true or not in order to proceed with some sort of a logical selection of some sort, like in this if statement, I need to use that equals in order to determine that. And I just want to make sure I'm not jumping over um, this one. Now, I'd, I want to make sure that you guys understand that distinction because that is kind of a little bit weird. Some of the things that you might want to pay attention to are also uh, these bullets here. Um, let's see. Remember we were talking about how emails are all lowercase. They actually have methods that ignores case. So all caps is OK if you use this. Then we have a couple others. And 
what I'm going to suggest that you do is that you kind of read up on these. And if you really need to use one, you can come back here and refer to it. I don't expect you to memorize this stuff. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, though, is this null thing. Um, all right, and this, this one always confuses people. Is this the same as this or this? It's kind of an interesting little question, right? Um, at least in our head, they, see, they see, it would seem to be the same. But this equal, or quote, quote, with nothing in between it, means it's still a string, there's just no content. If I say null, null indicates the absence of even the, the quotes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they try to do a, a job here. Um, all right, let's see if we can understand their uh, example. It says, the empty string word1 references a memory address where no characters are stored. The null string word2 uses null, so that word2 does not yet hold a memory address. You see the difference? So by virtue of even putting in the empty double quotes, there is a spot in memory that's being held for it. When it's set to null, there is no memory address yet. The program knows that we might use that, but the computer has not set aside the space yet. And there's reason why, why you actually might want to do that, believe it or not. Yeah, the, there's, no, uh, there's no location for it yet. That's a great that's a great analogy. So you, it's like the card catalog. You created the card, but it doesn't point to anywhere. So there's no space being taken up on the shelf. Uh, yeah, excellent, excellent. Very good. Um, all right, so the, the last one, it says, uh, word three is also a null string by default, and that is because we don't give it a value. So doing this is the same as doing the one above. Most people will just do this. Now, the question is, why would you bother? Right? Why would you bother? Well, the, the why you bother is, I know I'm going to do this in the program, so let me just declare it here. And then when I actually do use it, then the, the, the address will populate automatically. That's really the answer to that. Uh, we are continuing now on page 363 towards the bottom. Um, skipping over the you do it's. If you didn't catch that earlier, we're, we're bypassing those here. Uh, but please feel free to work on them on your own. So we're looking at a number of other string methods, some of those we saw on the table before, and some of them will be a little uh, different and new. But you might recognize these from other languages because many languages do them. We already talked about what two upper and two lower case mean, right? So if I have one letter, I can use that method and I can change it to whatever, whether upper or lower case. Uh, another one that's very common uh, to use is length. And the reason you might want to do, use that is remember I talked about how a string is really an array of characters, right? So if you want to, let's say, run a loop to step through that array or step through each character, you might want to know how long it is before you do something and try to do math to determine the loop. So you can run the length method to figure out how long it is. And that is helpful. But there's a little bit of a confusion, and that goes with this other method that is often used with it, which is the index of. Now, if you've worked with um, arrays, which I, you guys must have in other languages in order to get here, and we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. Um, when you put together an array, 
contents of the array, and I'll, I'll just go back to Excel here and use that kind of as a, as a guinea pig. So let's say I have this array of characters. This is the array. The array has a name. Let's just say I call it whatever. That's the name of the array. And then these are the contents of the array. But each array position has, and this should be familiar, I hope, What am I typing in? Yep, that's the index value of the array. Notice index of. So if I'm going to be stepping through an array looking for a particular character, sometimes I want to keep track of what position it's in. Now, some of the confusion with this comes from the fact that if I run length on the string hello, it returns the value of five because there's five things. How long is it? Five, right? So if I want to go to the fifth position in the array, one, two, three, four, five. So the fifth position in the array is four. So don't get confused by that, all right? So it's not unusual to see like, uh, string dot length minus one, that kind of thing, to get you in the right position. So just just be aware that there's that one number difference between the index of and, and the length. Computers start counting at zero, not one. All right, this little method here, this one allows us to determine what character sits at the position that we are looking for. So if I said character at zero, let's see this little example, and the string was Stacy at position zero, it would be the letter S. So zero, one, two, three, four, character at zero is S. All right. And I think some of these others, I, I think you can figure them out, ends with, starts with, right? Those are very common sense. Um, if you want to replace something, you might be able to do something like this. Wherever you find an N, replace it with an X. Another one that's useful, and you may have done this in other languages too, I don't know. Uh, I do it in my intro programming. Uh, it depends on your instructor, I suppose. But you could also take uh, something that's a number. So for example, here there's a number, see that? And it's 8.25. If I didn't have the double quotes around it, it's treated as a number. It's treated as a double or a decimal, right? It's a decimal number. It's got a value to it. If I run this little method here, to string, I take that number and turn it into text. Why is that important? Depending on how you're working with things, sometimes when you output stuff to the screen, it's easier to output it as text. Okay, those are some of the built in ones. Well, well, for example, like if I were, were going to do, um, let's say I was going to do a dialog box. And for those of you listening at home, uh, what we're talking about is an example of why you would use uh, this particular method. Um, and maybe this, maybe I'm thinking more visual basic than I'm thinking Java here. But sometimes you calculate a number and you want to like have the ease of putting it on screen as opposed to, let's say, having a snippet of text and then concatenating it. Do you notice how, how this, this wouldn't work because this is a different data type? So in order for me to add this to that string, 
I first have to convert it to string, and then I can concatenate it. Because the fact that this is a string, it won't allow me to do this. We can do this if we're doing a system out print line, because that method knows how to handle it. A string uh, data type or variable or object, really, um, isn't able to do that. So we have to convert it to a string in order for it to be to be able to go in. That that's uh, a good example. And the reason I'm, I'm thinking dialog box, think of like a dialog box, and sometimes it has like a little box where text pops in. In order to get the text in there, and I want to put a number in, I have to convert it to a string in order for the number to appear. That that's that's the example. Okay, I'm jumping ahead a little bit again. Uh, now I'm on page 370 at the bottom. And we're going to look at a, a section here where we are, you know, we just talked about taking a number and converting it to a string so that we can either take that and place it into a string variable or maybe use it for some sort of output where it has to be a string for it to work. Um, but in this case, we're looking at going the other way, and that is to take something that is a string and convert it so that it is a number so that we can do stuff with it or whatever the case may be. So there is a built-in method for that and that one is called parse int. And this is a word maybe you haven't encountered much in your programming, but here's my question to you. What does it mean to parse? All right, well, we did a little bit of searching here online to get a definition. Uh, in essence, what uh, parsing is, is the ability to read through some text or content and then be able to analyze it for what it is and then do what you need to do with it. But in order to, uh, let's say, um, take that number that is a string and convert it to a number, first I have to read through. So parsing is the process of stepping through the text. So when we are parse int, we are actually going through and reading through the string. And if it is a number, we will convert it to a number. All right, and they go through um, an example here of how to do that. Um, notice here that there's some other methods, for example, where we have value of, and that's where we take a string and we convert it to an integer. All right. But what we're talking about here is to go the other direction. All right. So you might need to manipulate some of these to do your work. And we'll see that in a while. Now, we did a parse int, and they also have a parse double. That's, of course, for a number with a decimal value. Okay, now we're at the bottom of page 374, and we're going to talk about string builder and string buffer. Okay, so they, they have a... A little bit of uh, explanation here that kind of gives you an overview as to why these things exist. So I'm going to kind of read through this first paragraph or so here, and then hopefully that will clarify a couple of things for you. But in essence, it tells us that um, when we create a string, um, that they're calling it immutable. Basically, it doesn't change. Once you have that data structure put together, that object put together, it is unchangeable, but you might go through and actually uh, try to change it. So it says when you write something, uh, write some string equals hello and follow it with some string equals goodbye, it says you have neither changed the contents of computer memory at the address represented by some string nor eliminated the characters hello. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing here? So if I go and I say some string equals hello, and then the next line I say some string equals goodbye, hello does not go away. It's still in computer memory. 
Now that's kind of strange, right? So what happens if I change it 50 times? Yeah, you got a whole bunch of stuff sitting in memory. All right, so you can see that might create a little bit uh, of a problem. It says, instead, you have stored goodbye at a new computer memory location. So this now points to a different spot in memory. It's not erasing hello. It's just putting this somewhere else. All right. But if you want to start changing the string, it says you can't add a space and everybody to this string. You have to create a new string. So even though I'm adding to what's already there, it's starting new again. So if I keep adding a word to the string, and keep adding a word to the string, and I do that 50 times, I got 50 versions, all of them occupying memory, and occupying a memory location. This can cause some pretty significant problems when you are trying to create an application that runs efficiently. If you're doing a couple simple things, like most of the stuff that we're doing, it doesn't really matter. But if you're processing uh, a string 5,000 times, sounds weird, but you might. There might be a reason that you do that. All, all of a sudden, you got all this like memory being chewed, chewed up by one string object that just ha has subtle changes happening to it. So in order to, as they say, circumvent these limitations, you can use one of these two classes and notice that they are classes indicating that you are going to build an object with the class. Okay, and that's string builder and string buffer. So if you're going to be changing a string, these are the tools that you are going to use. All right. So now as I continue here, they do make a point of saying that string builder and buffer are both part of the same language pack that string is. So it's like built into the language. Um, and it does say this about these two things, that basically they perform similar tasks. And in fact, for the most part, they can be used interchangeably. One is a little bit more efficient, meaning it'll work quicker. The other one is considered safe, meaning that because it's thread safe, a thread is kind of, um, we haven't really talked about what a thread is, a thread is a, a, like an execution path that's going through your processor. The string buffer is thread safe, meaning that something else going on in the system can't come in and interrupt it. It might take a little bit longer for it to work but the contents will not be obliterated. String builder is quicker and kind of, you know, disregards some of the safety things is really kind of the way to see it. But for the most part, for the stuff that we're doing, um, it, it doesn't matter what you pick because, you know, we're going to use such little pieces of code. We're not we're going to be working with, like, a, a textbook. You know, we're trying to read that much text. All right. So they go on and they say you can create a string builder object and you use the same kind of approach that you do with other constructors. So you, you declare string builder, you want to call it message, you say new string builder and you put in the message. And what does it do? It creates a string. So now that seems kind of silly, right? Because we can just use string. But keep in mind that if we're going to be manipulating things, that's where this comes in handy. Notice that when we work with uh, string builder and string buffer, we have other methods that are built into those. And here, for example, we might set the length. So if I have 
a string and I don't know how long it's going to be. You know, think about like your text messages. How long can a text message be? Does anybody know? I think it's 160 characters. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And, and actually, the total message I think is 256, but the rest of that is used for the addressing and the information that goes with it. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. All right. Um, similarly, we have this other thing that goes with it that's called capacity. I'm not so worried about that one. I don't think our exercises touch upon it. And I think we're getting close to as much material as I want to cover. I'm going to pause for a second just to make that determination. Some other handy little methods are the ones shown on page 378 here where we can append. Of course, append means add to the end of the string. So this is where you really start to see that improvement where with a regular string, if we were to say uh, happy and then add birthday to it, to say happy birthday, the one that's just happy still exists. Here with the string builder, it adds to it. It doesn't keep replicating things in memory. Then they have these other ones that go with it too. Character at is similar to what we saw before. And set character at, so we can actually take a position and just change that position. It doesn't create a new string, it just changes the one that we have. So you can see why that would be handy. Okay, and that, that is basically going to conclude our discussion for uh, chapter 7, and I'm going to terminate this video here, and then we're going to start working on the homework, and hopefully we can get through the chapter 7 exercises in the time that we have left. So this video ends now.